message, USS Canali to USS Cheyenne. We are under attack by four forces. Repeat, four forces. From Simon and Schuster Audio, Star Trek, Borg. Adapted for audio from the CD-ROM by Hilary Bader. Featuring Howard McGillan and John Delancey as Q. Personal Log, Cadet Kaylin Furlong, Stardate 54902. It has been six months since my brief and unusual posting aboard the USS Righteous. Six months since the Borg were destroyed by the Starfleet forces at Earth. Three times now the Borg have tried to attack the Federation, and three times they've been defeated. I hope they've learned their lesson, assuming there are any of them left alive to learn. Admiral Talati has requested a description of my experiences aboard the Righteous during the hours leading up to the actual battle. I'm not sure I want to examine it all that closely. I guess I'm afraid if I think about it too much, about how absurd and unbelievable it all was, it will turn out not to have been real at all. It began six months ago. I and four of my fellow classmates, all second-year cadets, had been given the opportunity to serve aboard the Federation starship Cheyenne for three months. It was the most exciting time in our lives. Checking out. Synchronize with base coil. Ensign, let the cadet have the navigation console. Cadet Furlong. Who, me, sir? Do you see another Cadet Furlong? Uh, yes, sir. I mean, no, sir. I mean... Just take the console, cadet. Right away, sir. But word quickly came. Priority message, USS Canali to USS Cheyenne. We are under attack by Borg forces. Repeat. The Borg, Borg ship had been observed heading on a direct course for Earth. We knew what this meant. As the crew made the ship battle ready, we, the lowly cadets, were also pressed into service. We were scared but at least we felt useful. But not for long. Visiting Starfleet cadets, please report immediately to conference room B. I was, uh, a little late. Complete. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Lieutenant. I was just, uh... 0730 means 0730, cadet. Sit down. First, the captain wanted me to convey his regrets for not being here himself. As I'm sure you've heard, Starfleet is amassing an armada in Sector 001 to defend against the latest Borg incursion. We, or rather our ship, is on her way to join them. Given the probability of armed conflict, the captain has ordered that all non-essential personnel, including visiting Starfleet cadets, be transferred off the ship to a safer venue at the medical research facility on Marnus 3. Please have your gear packed and be at Shuttle Bay 3 in 30 minutes. Dismissed. Cadet Furlong, a moment please. The captain has denied your request to stay on board, Cadet. I'm sorry. The massacre 10 years ago at Wolf 359 was a great tragedy for the Federation. I understand your need for justice. I'm sorry. Shuttle Bay 3 in 30 minutes. I returned to my quarters to pack. I was furious thinking about Wolf 359. My father had died there, killed by the Borg. I was only nine years old at the time. I had carried these feelings about the Borg for ten years. At that moment, despite all my Starfleet training, I only wanted one thing, 
a chance for revenge. And they were taking that away from me. Damn them. Temper, temper, young man. What would your father say? There was someone in my room. I reached for my comm badge. Intruder alert. Intruder... But it wasn't working. Perhaps I should introduce myself. I imagine you've heard of me, though, Q. It's short for Q. Oh, I'd heard of him all right. It was Q who'd introduced Captain Picard to the Borg. It's because of Q that ten years ago the Borg went to Wolf 359 and found the Federation's fleet of ships, and found my father, and killed them all. I knew him. I just never met him. Q, what do you want? He just smiled and started to recite. At 0800 hours during the Battle of Wolf 359, the USS Righteous... Such a noble name, Righteous, was hit by an unknown Borg weapons discharge and vaporized. How many times had I read those very words? The official report of the death of my father and the death of his comrades. How many times? Trying by the force of my own will to make it not true. Vaporized. No trace. Nothing to bury, nothing to mourn. The Borg took it all away from you in an instant. I understand your desire for justice. They don't, though, do they? But I do. You want action. You want to avenge your father's death. You want to kill Borg. What sentient, yet still barbaric bipedal hominid wouldn't? A Starfleet cadet will always remember that armed conflict is a last resort, to be avoided at all cost. I hesitated. My academy training went deep. This was not what I was supposed to want. A Starfleet officer's first duty... Maybe you didn't hear me. I'm offering you a chance to go and kill some Borg. Do you want to or not? I wondered if Q could read my mind. But no. What I felt was obvious to anyone. I... Yes. That's exactly what I want. So... Q snapped his fingers, and in the blink of an eye, we were standing on the bridge of a ship, a ship under attack by Borg. Time! 0758, sir. Keep those phases firing, and where are my photon torpedoes? Armed and ready, Captain. Have a look. I can't see you. It was true. I moved around among the crew, but no one noticed I was there. Let's see if we can shake them up a little, Ensign. Initiating Delta attack, sir. I'm reading a small weakness in the shields. Shields are holding fine, but power is down 10%. Weapons having no effect. Damn, they've adjusted their shields already. Recognize this place? You should, to keep a picture of it on your wall. The bridge of the USS Righteous. Your father's ship. Oh, I recognized it. And everyone on board. My father had told me about each of them. Captain Andropov. Ensign Targus, Counselor Baraka, <laughs> crusty old Doc Quint. Suddenly, I heard a voice. A voice I hadn't heard in over ten years. A voice that made my heart jump in my chest. The Tolstoy just took a major hit. It was the voice of Lieutenant Furlong. My father. This is him, isn't it? Well, I can see the family resemblance. I think she's pulling away. The Kyushu's coming on strong. Melbourne and Saratoga have lost power. Tolstoy, Kyushu, Saratoga, Melbourne. Recognize the name? Do you know where you are, cadet? I knew. Wolf 359. Ten years ago. Moments before this ship and everyone aboard would be destroyed. I heard the familiar shimmering sound, and a Borg transported onto the ship. I called out. Look out! But no one could hear me. I wasn't really there. Fortunately, Ensign Targus saw the Borg also, and alerted the crew. Captain! Intruder alert! Security, isolate the ops console now! Security! I looked over to the security console, and I saw a young Ensign, barely older than myself. He looked lost, out of his depth. Why was he there instead of the chief of security? Instead of Lieutenant Sprint? My father had talked a lot about Sprint, 
his old friend from the academy. I turned to Q. Q, where's the chief of security? Where's Lieutenant Sprint? Lieutenant Sprint was killed, and this first year Ensign had to take his place. And because of his inexperience, everybody on board, including your father, will be killed. Killed? When? Q wouldn't say. He just smiled in that maddening way he has, as if to say, you'll see. The Ensign pulled out a phaser and pointed it at the Borg. Q, the Ensign doesn't know what he's doing. He's trying to shoot the Borg. The phasers are useless. Just isolate the panel now. He's going to get them all killed. They need Sprint. If Lieutenant Sprint were still alive, he might be able to save the ship. But he's been dead for four hours. No wonder they don't want him on the bridge. You keep saying, if Sprint were alive, why? Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Thaddeus Quint. He actually tried to save Sprint's life, but as you can see, he failed the old goat. <laughs> I watched the scene unfolding. A scene whose ending I knew too well. This ship was about to be destroyed. And with it, an entire crew. And my father. He's bypassed the security lockout. Shield mutation is shifting on its own. Shields are dropping. Uh-oh. I need shields back up now. I pleaded with Q. If you're not going to do anything, let me help them. But he just smiled again and walked up to Doc Quint. The security ensign had been hit hard by the Borg. Doc Quint was trying to save him, but it was too late. Death in battle. If it were a Klingon, he'd be ecstatic. Ooh, I like this guy. Anyone near Jeffrey Six, we need manual power rerouted through the secondary couplings. It's too late. The board cube is firing. Invasive maneuvers. At exactly 0800 hours, the USS Righteous was vaporized. And I saw it happen. I'm not getting pretty Suddenly, I found myself in a strange place, floating. It was white and peaceful. Just me and white and Q. So, now that you've seen your father die, are you ready to avenge his death? Or would you like to try something different? How about a chance to prevent his death? If the good Dr. Quint had been able to save Sprint four hours before, then Sprint would have been able to save the righteous, and you would have grown up in the loving company of your father, and all for the want of a horseshoe nail. What say we give the old goat a second chance to save Sprint's life? You're not afraid of a little space-time continuum meddling, are you, cadet? No, I thought not. I wasn't sure what Q was offering me, but if it meant a chance to save my father's life, I knew I had to take it. Shall we? And suddenly, there we were again, on the Bridge of the Righteous. But it was different. No battle, no pork. Q had taken me back in time, to four hours before the scene I had just witnessed. Four hours before the Righteous was destined to be vaporized. I looked over to the security console. The young ensign was gone, and in his place was a tough-looking officer. Q, who is that? This is Lieutenant Sprint. Do you think he knows he's gonna die? I don't think so. Don't bother saying hello. Just makes saying goodbye that much harder. Time, Mr. Furlong. Oh, 400 hours, sir. Four hours before the battle at Wolf 359. Q had taken me another four hours back in time for a reason. I had to figure out what it was. Q within sensor range yet? Coming up now, Captain. Match speed, stay with it. Setting a pursuit course. Shields up. Intruder alert. Sprint, look out! Again, I heard the familiar shimmering sound, and I saw a Borg transport onto the bridge. Shall we dance? And within a heartbeat, Sprint disappeared, and suddenly I was standing where Sprint had been, wearing Sprint's uniform, holding Sprint's phaser. I looked up, and I saw Doc Quint disappear. And suddenly, Q was standing in Quint's place, wearing Quint's uniform, holding Quint's hypospray. Now I understood. I was to take Sprint's place. Q, 
cue would take Quint's place. And this would be my chance to save the righteous. I raised my phaser and shot the boy. But I was too slow. My shot only grazed him. He rushed me and started to choke me. I can still remember the feeling of his hard steel arm around my throat. I thought I had failed, but Q, or rather, Q as Doc Quint, rushed behind the Borg and hit him with the hyper spray. The Borg collapsed in the heat on the floor. Q smiled. He seemed awfully pleased with himself. Funny, at that moment, even I began to think of him as Doc Quint. The Borg Q began to pull away. The captain jumped into action. Not speed, keep us within close range. Remember, his friend should have died right here. Everything you do in his place from this moment on changes history. Invigorating, isn't it? Meddling with fate. But all I could think about was time. I had four hours before the righteous was destined to explode. Four hours to figure out what I was supposed to do to save the ship. To save my father. And I knew Q wasn't going to tell me. Counselor Baraka began to stare into my eyes. I thought for a moment that he could see through the illusion and knew I wasn't really Lieutenant Sprint. I should have known better. Q's illusions are reality. Lieutenant, are you all right? My father walked up to me and patted me on the shoulder. Sprint? <laughs> He's an ox. Nothing scares him. And nothing hurts him. Isn't that right, Lieutenant? <laughs> there are all kinds of pain, Lieutenant. Don't let the fact that you are Bajani prevent you from acknowledging the hurt. Oh, please. Bajani. My dad used to talk about Sprint's Bijani abilities. Baraka's comment made me wish I had spent more time in the Academy Species Library and learned a little more about the Bijani race, since I was going to be a Bijani for at least another four hours. Captain, coded message coming in from Admiral Hansen. He's ordering us to proceed with all speed to rendezvous with the rest of the fleet at Wolf 359, requesting us not to engage the Borg. Until then, maintain radio silence until contacted. Helm laying a course for Wolf 359. Pull ahead of the Borg cube and then match speed. Aye, sir. I wanted to ask a question, but I was afraid to speak. Afraid my voice would give away my secret, that I wasn't really Lieutenant Sprint. But I knew I couldn't stay silent for the next four hours. I turned to the captain. Sir, what about the dead Borg? My voice didn't sound any different to me, but no one else seemed to notice. I guess to them, I looked like Sprint and sounded like him too. The captain looked over at Targus. Targus, get that thing off my bridge. Yes, sir. Targus started to lift the Borg. That's when I noticed it. For the first time, Targus had some kind of circuitry attached to her forehead. I wondered what it was for. Suddenly, the dead Borg came back to life. It grabbed Targus and began to interface with the tactical console. It was trying to take over control of the ship. Security alert! Shooter! Shoot her! I thought, if Q is telling me to shoot Targus, there must be a reason. So I did. Suddenly, everything froze, except for Q. He seemed a little upset. If I told you to jump into a Signian vortex, would you do it? You're a sentient being of sorts. Try using this. You know, all this space-time manipulation does take some effort on my part. It's not that easy. I'd appreciate it if you'd make a little effort, too. Q waved his hand, and once again, time shifted. I jumped back in time. This time, only a few moments. The dead Borg had just come back to life and was holding the struggling Targus in his hands. I wondered how many chances Q would give me, how many mistakes it would take before Q would just let the righteous get vaporized and me along with it. Well, if he was giving me a second chance, I wasn't going to make the same mistake twice. I knew shooting Targus wasn't going to help, so I shot the console. Out. I'm okay. The Borg was hit by a surge of energy and fell into a heap on the floor. Definitely dead this time. Then get him definitely off my bridge this time. Mr. Sprint, reconfigure your security console so you can control Tactical B. 
Then meet me down at the computer core. I want to secure this ship in case the Borg try and board us again. Good shooting. Thanks. How about quick thinking, Quint? Good work, Quint. Nobody ever gives me any credit for anything I do. That's because we don't like you, Quint. I think we can all save our hostility for the Borg, where it will be better placed, don't you? Let me ask you something, Baraka. Do you just spout these platitudes, or are you deluded enough to actually believe in them? Come on, Quint. No matter how hard you try, you're not going to change my mind. I still like you. <laughs> he kissed me. I looked across the bridge at my father. I wanted to run to him, tell him who I was, about all that has happened to me since he died. But I realized that wouldn't be too smart. When he looks at me, he sees Lieutenant Sprint, his old academy buddy. Hey, Sprint. What, are you having one of your Bajani trances? I looked away, embarrassed, and set about reconfiguring the security panel. It took me a lot longer than it would have taken Sprint, but hey, I wasn't really Sprint. I was only a second year cadet. Then I headed for the computer core room. When I got off the turbo lift, I was in an empty corridor. I realized I was lost. Suddenly, Q was floating in front of me. Oh, that's right. I keep forgetting the difficulties of dealing with your limited humanoid mind. If it's not right in front of you, you don't notice it. I've given you a tool to see beyond the superficial veneer of reality to a deeper level of knowledge and understanding. And you ignore it. I should be hurt. But then again, I'm not the one who keeps getting killed. Killed? What is that supposed to mean? Q? Q! What is that? But Q just smiled like a Cheshire cat and disappeared. I consulted the tricorder Q had given me and found my way to the computer core room. Sorry I'm late, Captain. Lieutenant Furlong. What have you got? We were trying to route all of the ship's controls through the security systems as an extra precaution. But something kept rejecting all of our attempts to access the security programs. And that's when we found this. He pointed to a small metallic device implanted on the computer core routing system. The design, the display, everything about it was classic Borg design. It's obviously Borg. But how did it get on the ship? And what is its purpose? It seems to be tied in directly to the security systems, locking us out. Question is, how do we remove it? Sprint, you're the security officer. What do you think? It looked pretty simple to me. I took a cutting tool and severed its connection to the computer. It seemed like the logical choice. Self-destruct initiated. What the hell? Computer aboard, self-destruct. Self-destruct in 10 seconds. Bridge, override all security systems. I can't, Captain. Five seconds. I'm locked out. Four, three, two, one. Great. I'd managed to obliterate the righteous. This was not going well. I was supposed to save these people, not kill them. I found myself in Q's white space again, floating, unaware of time or dimension. Mm-hmm. Meddling with things you don't understand again? You know, I think I'm learning something here. Hubris. That's what I don't like about you people. Your ignorance of the working of the galaxy is unparalleled, and yet you continue to blunder ahead as if you knew what were going on. The Borg, on the other hand, really seem to know what they're about. If only they had more personality. In fact, if they had any personality, I might consider spending more time with them. But for now, don't touch what you don't understand. And I was back in the computer core room, five minutes earlier, replaying the moments before I blew up the ship with my careless decision. We were trying to route all of the ship's controls through the security systems as an extra precaution. But something kept rejecting all of our attempts to access the security programs. And that's when we found this. Hmm. 
This was beginning to sound familiar. It's obviously Borg. But how did it get on the ship? And what is its purpose? It seems to be tied in directly to the security systems, locking us out. Question is, how do we remove it? Sprint, you're the security officer. What do you think? This time, I knew better. I told them we didn't know enough about it to try to disengage it. Mr. Sprint is right. Until we know more about Borg technology, I don't think we should make any attempts to interfere with the implant directly. Captain, we were within transporter range for only 6.7 seconds. Mm -hmm. I don't see how the Borg transported to the bridge and implanted the circuit unless... Unless? Is it possible two Borg transported onto the ship? If there is another Borg on this ship, he's found a way to screen against our usual senses. I'll get Targus to scan against anomalies. See what you can do to help. Ensign Targus, Lieutenant Furlong, and I huddled over a console on the bridge. Targus kept tuning and tuning. The scanners were recalibrated within microns. Targus sure had a knack for this. I'd never seen anyone so thorough. Targus, enough. You've got the scans so sensitive, they're going to alert us if a particle of dust falls. If that particle of dust falls off a board, then I want to know about it. You're too cautious. You're too lax. Sprint, Wait, tell him. <laughs> you know, if it weren't for me, you guys wouldn't have had any fun at the Academy. <laughs> if it weren't for me, you guys wouldn't have graduated from the Academy. Targus put her hand to her forehead, covering that circuitry device I had noticed earlier. She looked embarrassed by it, like she was trying to hide it, or hide what it represented. What? Oh, Lieutenant Furlong, Lieutenant Sprint, and Ensign Targus. Somehow that's not quite how I pictured it. That's not your fault. Every time I see that thing, it reminds me of how much courage it must have taken for you just to be here. And of how much we both owe Sprint. Just don't let Sprint here. His head's big enough already. I liked this feeling. The three of us together. I was beginning to feel like I belonged. Then Doc Quint walked up. Well, to everyone else, he looked like Doc Quint. But at least I knew it was Q. What exactly do you owe him? You'll spend the rest of your life a slave to technology. I'm not a slave to it. In six months, a year at the most, I won't even need this. In three hours, four at the most, we won't even be alive. Unless we're Borg. Then Quint walked away from us. I wondered, was that Quint talking? Or was that really Q trying to tell me something? Reminding me that I only had a few hours left to figure out how to save this ship. Dr. Quint is testing the boundaries of the humanoid ability to maintain affection for him, which he thinks he's not worthy of. So what he does is he tries to make everyone dislike him. Well, he's very good at that. <laughs> he's right about one thing. We could end up as Borg. And I know the last thing I want to have happen to me is to be assimilated into the Collective. We won't let it happen. To any of us, better dead than Borg. Agreed? Even Quint. Not even Quint deserves to be Borgified. But the Borg definitely deserve Quint. We got him. Somewhere in Jeffrey's tube six. Sprint, furlong. Take a couple of fully charged phasers, flush out the Borg, and neutralize him. Understood? Yes, sir. My dad. Lieutenant Furlong and I headed into the Jeffrey's tube. He's been through here. Magnetic resonance traces. Okay, one of us has to go, but somebody should stay in case he went through and doubled back. I'll go through the corridor and then... Whoa, 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 whoa. I said one of us, I didn't say you. All right. Watch your back. Watch yours and Lieutenant Furlong slipped into the corridor and out of sight. Suddenly, there was a voice in my ear. Bad idea. I turned. It was a Borg. No, it wasn't a Borg. It was Q. For a moment, I thought maybe Q had been captured and turned into a Borg. But of course, that would be impossible. Nothing happens to Q unless he wants it to happen. You see, there is another Borg. And he's waiting in the corridor for whoever comes out first. 
poor old dad. I hope you don't feel guilty. I turned back to the corridor. There he was. Furlong. Dad. They'd gotten to him. He was... Borg. I shot at him, but he put up a shield to protect himself. Good try, but you see the Borg are clever in their own monolithic way. They adjust to hits from any phaser, and they all know how to shield themselves against that frequency. Q grabbed my phaser and adjusted the frequency to a higher EM band. You have to adjust along with them. Then he shot me the furlong. No! He's... He's dead. You shot him. Why? You did say you wanted to kill Borg, didn't you? I like the irony of it. But aren't you forgetting someone or something? Yes, I had. The other Borg. Before I realized it, he was next to me, shoving his cyborg arm into my neck. Everything went black. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. If it looks like a Borg, walks like a Borg, and sees like a Borg, then it must be a Borg. I saw a sensor display everywhere I looked. It was in some language I'd never seen before, but somehow I understood it. Voices. Millions of voices speaking to me, filling my head. I felt compelled to obey. Suddenly I understood. I was now a Borg. No Borg is an island unto himself. Every Borg is part of the whole. Everywhere I looked, I was flooded with information. Information I could have used against the Borg. If only I weren't now one of them. Do you hear that? Filling your mind, telling you what to think, what to do. Welcome to the Collective, Cadet. One voice came to me clearly. Above all others, the orders were meant for me alone. Four doesn't mean third of four. Absorb, destroy, obey. Time to go assimilating. I followed the voices in my head, screaming at me. Assimilate. Destroy. And I headed to the bridge to do just that. To find my comrades and kill them. I didn't want to, but I couldn't stop myself. My every step was controlled by the will of the Collective. What I wanted didn't matter anymore. I stepped out of the turbo lift onto the bridge. Everyone saw me. Saw that I had become a Borg. Oh, Sprint, what have they done? They tried their phasers, but it was no use. They've adapted to the frequency settings of our phasers. So I raised my weapon arm and killed them all. Captain! Don't feel bad, though. If it ever goes to trial, you can always claim the Collective made you do it. This time, try not to get caught. There we go again, I thought. If at first you don't succeed, Q will let you try, try again. I was back in Jeffrey's Tube 6 with my father, searching for the second Borg. I knew one thing. I wasn't going to let my dad, Lieutenant Furlong, go into that corridor. This time... It'd be me. He's been through here. Magnetic resonance traces. Okay, one of us has to go, but somebody should stay in case he went through and doubled back. I'll go through the corridor, and then... Whoa, 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 whoa. I said one of us, I didn't say you. You're right. I'm saying me. Watch your back. Watch yours, and... Maybe we should retune the phasers? Why? Call it a hunch. 
and I slipped into the corridor, leaving Lieutenant Furlong behind. I saw the Bork. I knew from my short experience as a Bork where he was vulnerable. That circuit in his chest. If I could get to that. We struggled. I heard a phaser shot. And the Borg fell dead. I turned to see who had fired the shot that saved my life. It was Lieutenant Furlong. Dad. Good idea. Retuning the phaser to a higher EM band frequency. You're right, they probably already adapted to the old one. Furlong took the circuit out of the Borg's chest. And we joined Targus, Baraka, and the captain on the bridge. I'm just not getting anything useful from it. Maybe if we hooked it into the ship's computer and had it analyzed. I'd like to know more about it first. Sprint, what do you think? I looked around. Everyone was waiting for my answer. I knew that any choice I made could be the one that saved or condemned this ship. Then I noticed Targus. Her implant. I had taken the time to read up on her service record before she joined the Righteous. Ensign Targus had risen to the rank of lieutenant, but she had been captured during the Patrici Wars, tortured using a neural stimulation device. Pleasurable, they say, but extremely addictive. Once they had a prisoner addicted, they withheld the stimulation until they got what they wanted. Sprint, the real Sprint, had rescued her. Sprint stayed with her for weeks until she was through the worst. The implant had been wired into her neural circuits, it feeds them a constant stream of data, a kind of white noise, to block out the craving. In a few months, the craving will be gone. But until then, without the implant, Targus would be in danger of slipping back into addiction. I hadn't realized I was staring at it, but she blushed and turned her head away. What? My implant? I don't understand. And so Targus's implant works along the same basic principles as the Borg circuit. She might be able to interface with it. I watched Baraka's face. I knew what his reaction would be. No. You can't possibly be suggesting that Ensign Targus be allowed to interface with the implant. Nobody is suggesting anything of the kind. In truth, Captain, interfacing with the implant would be somewhat like auto-neural stimulation, an experience which Ensign Targus is quite familiar with. Exactly the point, Captain. Ensign Targus' neural implant is designed to counteract the side effects of that kind of neural stimulation experience. This kind of neural input is... Does is... anybody mind if I join in on this discussion? You're all talking about me as if I weren't here. Ensign, the long-term effects of your recovery won't... Counselor, the concept of long-term effects loses its meaning when the entire Federation is in danger of obliteration. I'm ready. Whatever you have to go through, Targus, will be there for you. Counselor, I've already been through hell and back. I don't think this could be any worse. We slipped the Borg circuit into place. It interfaced with her implant easily. Too easily. <laughs> she jolted. Tensed. <laughs> She's in agony. You've never had to deal with pain, have you, friend? <laughs> Shut up. Uh, assimilation. Technology. Channels. Subspace channels. The Borg implant taking over systems. Communication with Collective. Jam systems. The Borg implant is getting its orders from the Borg Collective. How do we jam the signals, Targus? Uh, shields. Modulate mutations. 0.6525 of normal. Now! Do it! The bridge exploded with activity. Everyone rushing to a station. Modulating shield mutation. The Borg cube is scanning us. What's happening with those shields, Mr. Furlong? Almost there, sir. They're firing! Mr. Furlong! Got it. They've stopped firing. The shield settings must be in sync with the Borg scanners. They sense us as being part of the collective. Targus was still connected to the Borg circuit. And now we had cut off that circuit from the collective. Her reaction was violent. Yeah. Yeah. Alone. We are... Resistances! You will be assimilated! The shield has yeah. cut off the Borg circuit from the Borg Collective. We've got a disconnector. Ah. Uh, Q, uh, Quint, can't you give her something to stop the pain? 
One more cc of you are locked and should be a vegetable for life. Do you want to be responsible for turning Ensign Targus into a Bodian Zucchini? I tried to think of what I could do to help. I wanted to reach out and pull the Borg circuit out of Targus's implant, but I knew I'd just be jolted back by the painful energy burst. Suddenly, I remembered something about Sprint, about Bijanis. When in pain or injured, a Bajani can go into a kind of trance. They can separate their consciousness from the rest of the autonomic nervous system. And I was Sprint. I was a Bajani. Hugh had made me one. I reached out and grabbed the Borg circuit. I could feel the pain shooting through all my muscles. But I held on. Then, there was the oddest sensation. As if my consciousness was separated from my body, I was floating in that nothing space, waiting for Q to tell me what an idiot I'd been. Q, am I... No. You're not dead. You're unconscious. In a Bajani pain trance. Interesting phenomena. I'm not sure what its evolutionary benefit was for the Bajani. Something like a Terran possum, perhaps. Oh, look. You're regaining consciousness. My eyes opened. I was back on the bridge with Captain Andropov, Ensign Targus, Quint, and Baraka. They were all staring at me. Welcome back, Lieutenant. I guess this means I owe you my life twice, huh, Sprint? Targus was okay. My trick with the Bajani pain trance had worked. I've never seen anyone go into a Bajani pain trance before. Interesting. You were clearly unconscious. Yet your body managed to finish the task at hand. I suppose it's part of the survival mechanism. Quick thinking. Next time, they'll warn me. While you were out, we did a diagnostic on the computer systems. The Borg implant is continuing to rewrite code. I'm sending an away team over to the Borg cube to see if they can find anything that'll help us disable the implant. Targus and I are going, but we could use a third. I don't know if we'll get out of there alive. I won't order you to go, Lieutenant. Oh, we few, we happy few, we band of Borg. They're turning this into some heroic escapade, trying to make it impossible to turn down. I'll go. We don't need you, Quint. We need someone we can trust. Targus and Furlong both looked at me. Just like old times, somebody. Huh, Three against the world. Coming. Did I really have a choice? I'd accepted Q's challenge in order to try and save my father's life. There was no way I was going to let him go over to the Borg cube without me. Try and stop me. Okay. Here's your phaser. Each of ours has been retuned to a different frequency. Here, take this. I don't think we need an emergency med kit. If things get that bad, we're probably dead. There are many ways to die. Some of them are more painful than others. There's an emergency hypospray programmable for neuro painkillers just in case. You do know how to use it, don't you? I think I was learning to pick up on Q's little subtleties. Why was he giving us this med kit? Why the dig about the hypospray? I knew I had to find out more about this hypospray. We're coming alongside the Borg cube. Good luck. Energize. Lieutenant Furlong, Ensign Targus, and I transported onto the Borg cube. I... Even now, remembering it, I get chills. The inside of the Borg ship was huge. Overwhelming. Row upon row of Borg cubicles each with a dormant Borg. Fluids carrying nutrients, wires carrying data, force-feeding information and sustenance into the living yet not living beings that were once something and were now only Borg. There must be over a thousand Borg in here. Two thousand. Looks like they're all in some kind of a sleep mode. Not all of them. Look. Two Borg moved slowly towards us. What do we do? Let's see what they do first. They got closer and closer. I wanted to shoot, but suddenly I recognized one of them. It was Q. I held my fire, but as he passed, he leaned in towards me and said, You'll be back. 
At the time, I wasn't sure what he meant by that. Now, I know. They walked past us, Q and the other Borg, the real Borg, as if we didn't exist. Then we rushed down the Borg corridor to what looked like a Borg control console. Okay, security. You think you can bypass the Borg lockouts and give us the information we need? I can try. Looks like a pretty standard interface. But I must have tripped an alarm. Three Borg came after us. We managed to kill two. Suddenly, all the sleeping Borg began to wake up. Hundreds of them. I knew we were dead. Then, everything just froze. Q's face floated before me. That's the trouble with Borg. You kill one, there's always another one to take its place. You're never gonna figure out how to interface until you learn how to think like a Borg. Kill them before they kill you. Strike first! Then, there I was again, transporting onto the Borg cube with Targus and Furlong. They thought they were seeing this all for the first time. They didn't know they'd already lived this moment once before. There must be over a thousand Borg in here. Two thousand. Looks like they're all in some kind of a sleep mode. Not all of them. Look. Now, once again, two Borg moved towards us. What do we do? Let's see what they do first. But I wasn't going to wait. Not this time. What was it Q said? Strike first. I aimed right for its soft spot and shot. It buckled. I couldn't believe it. It kept coming. Targus! Furlong! Run! Sprint! Targus and Lieutenant Furlong aimed their phasers a little better than I. With three shots, the two Borg were dead. But I was hurt. Furlong, I'm... I'm sorry. I think I'm slipping into a pain trance. Furlong had the hypo spray out, and he was programming it for something. Hold on, buddy. I need you conscious. Don't go into one of your pain trances yet. What is that? It's something to counteract the Bajani adrenaline. I want to keep one of his pain trances. Furlong put his arm under my head and hit me with the hypo spray. It's working. Sprint, I'm sorry about that. You're gonna have to deal with the pain just like the rest of us humanoids. Don't worry. I can... Furlong, look out! Suddenly, three more Borg appeared. They knocked Furlong and Targus away. One of them grabbed me. Come on, we have to get out of this corridor before more of them come. But it's got Sprint! Later, that's an order. I was too weak to move. The Borg had me in his iron grip. Have you ever seen a Borg? Up close? The skin? The flesh that was once part of a living being? pierced through with connectors and wires and probes and exposed circuitry. Did you ever wonder how it felt? I looked into this Borg's eyes, looking for one spark of the living being it had once been. They were dead, cold as stone. I could see the needle protruding from his arm as he reached towards my neck. I blacked out. I opened my eyes. It had happened again. I was a Borg. My head throbbed where they had attached me to a mechanical eyepiece. The same inexorable sound of voices ordering me to do this, do that. The horrible feeling of once again being at the mercy of another's will. The will of the Collective. I walked up to the console and slipped my Borg arm in and interfaced. A flood of information came to me. Borg designate beta, alpha set of three. Assimilate knowledge. Interface. Assimilate. Including the codes for bypassing the Borg security lockouts. It was so easy. I had all the information I needed to save the righteous. But 
No way to use it. No way to help my friends defeat their enemy. I was a Borg now. I was the enemy. I tried to do something. To exert my own will. It was... a pain I can't even describe. Every cell in my body hurt. But worse, I could feel it in my soul. SCP Beta, Alpha 73, alert. Two life forms, target to destroy. Target, destroy. Alert, alert. I heard a noise behind me. It was Furlong. He looked at me with such a great sadness in his eyes. I'm sorry, but... I wanted to tell him it was okay. I... I... but I couldn't. Then, he shot me. I was dying, and all I felt was relief. Being a Borg is a terrible thing. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Not even a Borg. But I didn't die. There I was again, standing in the Borg corridor, as if nothing had happened. This was the third time I was replaying this moment. There must be over a thousand Borg in here. Two thousand. Looks like they're all in some kind of a sleep mode. Not all of them. Look. And once again, two Borg moved towards us. What do we do? Let's see what they do first. This time, I let the two Borg pass by. We rushed back to the Borg console. Okay, security. You think you can bypass the Borg lockouts and get us the information we need? I sure as hell did. I'd been through a lot to get to learn how to bypass the lockouts. Killed twice. Borgified once. I knew I had to get it right this time. How many more chances would Q give me before he just gave up and let me die? Let them all die. I punched in the sequence I had learned when I had been Borgified. Information streamed across the console screen. Most of it just symbols we couldn't understand. Suddenly, the symbols changed to binary numbers. Zeros and ones. The interspecies numerical system. Even we could understand. Designations? Codes? There it is! The code for accessing the implant aboard the Righteous. If we could just find a way to communicate with the implant, we could feed it this sequence and order it to shut down. If we were Borg, we could communicate with the Borg implant on our ship, right? Yes, but we're not Borg. I know. But what makes a Borg a Borg? How do they recognize one another? There must be a coded signature inside each Borg's personal circuit. Like the circuit we pulled off that Borg we killed in the Jeffrey's tube. I'll bet it contained a Borg signature. Damn, if we still had that dead Borg circuit, we could use that to convince the implant we were Borg. That's not a bad idea. But the circuit was fried. There are almost 2,000 Borg on this ship. I'm sure we could find a cooperative one. As if on cue, a Borg turned down our corridor. Get that circuit. Targus took aim at the Borg. I reached out and stopped her. No, wait. A circuit from a dead Borg won't do us any good. Sprint's right. We need a living Borg. Lieutenant Furlong took out the hypo spray. There's got to be something we can use on the Borg that'll stun them without killing them. I took out my tricorder, the special one that Q had given me. The hypo spray had several setting options. A setting that would stun a Borg. A setting that would block Bajani adrenaline and keep me from going into a pain trance. Lieutenant Furlong had already used that one. And, oddly enough, a setting for Bajani adrenaline itself. A good shot of that would send me right into a Bajani pain trance. Once again, I thought I sensed the perverse hand of Q. If that setting existed, there must be a reason. First, though, I set it to stun the Borg. There. That setting would stop a Cardassian Mastodon. Then a Borg walked by. Not a real Borg. It was Q, with his Borg eyepiece and Borg arm, 
and a Borg circuit in his chest. Just the kind of circuit we needed. I jumped him and hit him in the neck with the hypo spray. It's not working. He didn't check the tricorder. I have no biological components. You should have waited for one of the others. He twisted my arm until it snapped. I've never felt such pain. I was sure this was it. For long. Things are fading. I think I'm going into a Bijani pain trance. Lieutenant Verlon took the hypospray back and started to reprogram it. Hold on, buddy. We need you conscious. Don't go to one of your pain trances. No! Yeah, a Borg grabbed Targus. Before Furlong could stop my pain trance, two more Borg came. Furlong, get out of here! I'm sorry. Furlong got away. I saw Targus's face as she realized her worst nightmare. She was about to be turned into a Borg. Then, I felt myself fading away. Where am I? You are in a Bajani pain trance. Your friend Furlong wasn't able to stop it. The Borg don't seem to notice, though. They're assimilating you at this very moment. At least this time, you won't feel it. You're right. And then, I started to come back to consciousness. Oh, it looks like you're waking up. I came to. I was a Borg. But I didn't feel like a Borg. I felt like me. Interesting. Borg, yet not Borg. Do you feel it? It's different this time, isn't it? It certainly was different. I could hear the collective, see the orders streaming across my view, but nothing was compelling me to obey. Designate Beta, Alpha Set of Free, Alert, Destroy. Unassimilated life form, Destroy, Alert, Destroy. I didn't reply to the orders, but I wanted to. I wanted to send the collective a big resounding no. I looked over and saw a Borg was about to shoot Furlong. I raised my weapon arm and shot the Borg first. Furlong looked at me, all confused. Pretty good shot for a half Borg, half Bijani, eh, Furlong? Sprint! It's still you! Look out! Targus shot us both dead. Poor Targus. Poor us. And I was floating in that peaceful place again. Yay! Now that was the right action. Proving to yourself that you didn't have to listen to that nasty old Borg collective. True, you are dead. But now you know something you didn't know before, right? Well then, it was worth the trouble. Q was right. We needed a living Borg in order to disarm the Borg implant. But if I could get myself into a pain trance before I was Borgified, I could be the living Borg we needed. We wouldn't have to capture one. I was back in the Borg corridor. I held the hypo spray again. Q, the Borg Q, had just walked past me. Targus and Furlong were back to normal, waiting for me to hit one of the Borgs with the hypo spray. I checked the hypo spray. It was set to stun a Borg, but that's not what I needed. Quickly, I reset it to dispense Bijani adrenaline and hit myself in the neck. Sprint, what have you done? He sent himself into a Bajani pain trance. I saw the look of utter shock on my crewmates' faces. How could I explain this to them? Then I started to pass out. And there I was in that peaceful white space. Oh, smart move. Sending yourself into a Bajani trance before you get Borgified. I only hope you're in time to stop them before they Borgify your friends. I came to in the corridor on the Borg cube. As I guessed, I had been Borgified. I could hear the voices. I had access to all Borg information. But because I had been in a pain trance when it happened, I was in total control. A renegade Borg. I turned to see my crewmates, my friends, struggling in the grip of two Borg. I raised my weapon arm and shot both Borg. They were, to say the least, surprised. Targus and Furlong turned towards me. They raised their weapons. They were going to shoot me. Don't shoot! Wait! 
afraid I think it's him. It's still Sprint. <laughs> All right, we'd better get out of here before it's crawling with Borg. I'll wait, team to righteous. Three to beam directly to computer core. Now. We transported into the computer core room. When Captain Undropoff saw me, all Borgified, I thought he was going to drop. Wait, no! Captain, no, it's all right. I interfaced my Borg arm with the implant. Numbers ran across my field of vision. The implant asked me for my designation. I... How do I explain this to someone who has never experienced being a cybernetic being? I sang my designation to it, and it sang back. Like friends, we recognized one another as being part of the collective. It was now open to my will. I gave it an order to shut down. And instantly, it released its hold on all the ship's systems. We have complete control again, sir. Captain, I have a message from Admiral Hansen. We are engaging the Borg. The Righteous is ordered to remain outside the battle until all first and second line defenses are exhausted. At your discretion, that was all, sir. And so it begins. You mean there's nothing we can do? Not until we're called into action by either the Admiral or the Borg. They also serve who sit and wait, Lieutenant. Let's get a battle ready. Still half Borg, half Sprint, I returned to the bridge. The Righteous's shields protected me from the Collective. Their voices were silent. We sat and waited. Ugh, I just hate sitting here doing nothing. You worried that the battle will be won without you, Targus? Worried that the battle will be lost without us. It's important to have a positive outlook, even in the bleakest of situations. <laughs> it doesn't get much bleaker than this. <sighs> what? Nothing. I was just thinking about Kalen. Kalen? My son. Me. What were you thinking? <laughs> I think by now all my friends are tired of hearing me brag about Kale, and I'm sure they don't want to hear any more. Go ahead. I guess I was just wondering what was going to happen to him. He's only eight. No, wait. He's nine. Growing up without his dad, that's going to be rough. He'll be all right. How do you know? I know, and so do you. I suppose I do. His mother's a strong woman. She'll see to that. It's just... Yes? I won't get to see him grow up. I'll never get to know him. Uh, as a man, I mean, only me, uh, a poet, a painter, an historian. A Starfleet officer. <laughs> There's so much we're both gonna miss. If only he knew how true that was. I wanted to tell him. I wanted to reach out and say, Dad, it's me, Kalen. But I knew I had to keep the illusion going. I had to be Sprint to save everyone's life. So I didn't say anything, but I wanted to. I guess I'm a real case, huh, Counselor? Not as bad as Quint, though. What's his problem? He's trying to prove that people actually like him. Oh, spare me the psychology, Counselor. You don't have the tools to analyze me. Your problem is very straightforward, Doctor. You desperately want to be liked. If I wanted to be liked, all I'd have to do is snap my fingers, and I'd be liked. I'm an omnipotent being masquerading as Dr. Quint. Whatever I want to happen, happens. Interesting fantasy. Subspace message, sir. No audio. Read it, Ensign. Orders from Admiral Hansen deploying third wave attack when ready. Battle stations. Take us in, Targus. Maximum power to the shields. Spread fire phases. Keep the frequency changing and get those torpedoes online. Time! 0758, sir. Keep those phases firing. And where are my photon torpedoes? Armed and ready, sir. Let's see if we can shake them up a little, Ensign. Yes, sir. Initiating Delta attack. I'm reading a small weakness in the shields. Shields are holding five, but power is down 10%. Weapons having no effect. Damn. They've adjusted their shields already. Here we are again. Back at the beginning. Q was right. This is the moment I witnessed before. 
The moment when the righteous is vaporized. The moment I came on board to prevent. The Tolstoy just took a major hit. I think she's pulling away. The Kyushu's coming on strong. Saratoga and Melbourne have lost power. Tolstoy, Kyushu, Saratoga, Melbourne, all ships that were lost at Wolf 359. Will they be adding righteous to the list? Captain! Intruder alert. I heard the shimmer of a transporter, and just like it happened the first time, a Borg transported onto the ship and immediately interfaced with the ops console. Security, Security, isolate the ops console! At 0800 hours, during the Battle of Wolf 359, the USS Righteous was hit by a Borg weapons discharge and vaporized. It's in your hands. I hesitated. What was I to do? Security! Sprint, just isolate the console. That won't work. What will? We can't kill the Borg. I can. I had a weapon to use against this Borg that no one else on the bridge had. I was a Borg, too. I rushed up to the Borg and slammed my Borg arm into his chest interface. We... The only way I can describe it is to say we struggled. Not physically, but mentally. He was strong, this Borg, but without a will of his own. I kept sending the same signal. Shut down. Shut down. Shut down. Finally, I remembered something from my history lessons about the Borg. I remembered who was aboard this Borg cube, who commanded all these Borg. I sent him a new message. A lie. I am Locutus of Borg. Shut down. Shut down. It worked. Shield mutation is modulating. The Borg collapsed in a heap. The Borg cube is pulling away, sir. It's ignoring us completely as if we weren't here. It thinks we've been vaporized. For a minute there, I thought we would be. Where is it headed, Ensign? Direct course for Sector 001, sir. I wonder what chance the Starfleet forces have of stopping the Borg at Earth. Actually, they will succeed. The Enterprise, utilizing the emergency transporters on the shuttlecraft, will recapture their Borgified Picard and stop the Borg incursion just in the nick of time. And how do you know that, Quint? I told you already. I'm an omnipotent being. Q waved his hands, and in a flash, he became Q. And I? I was no longer a Borg. I was no longer Lieutenant Sprint, either. I was just... me. Who are you? And what happened to Dr. Quint and Lieutenant Sprint? And what have you done to my crew? I'm afraid the Lieutenant died about four hours ago. Not my doing. He was supposed to die, just as all of you, I'm afraid, are supposed to be vaporized here at Wolf 359. That's how it's written in the history books. History? Are you telling us you're from the future? He is. I am, well, as I said, I exist outside the confines of the space-time continuum. That is, if I want to. My little friend here wanted a chance to come back and save this ship from destruction. And to my great surprise, he succeeded. Lieutenant Furlong, Dad, kept staring at me, like he was trying to make sense of something. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to fool anybody. I, I just wanted to help. So you were just pretending to be Sprint. Why? Who are... Then his face changed. He smiled. Caitlin! Please, I'm trying to figure this out. As I said, I didn't expect Cadet Kalen to succeed here, and now that he has... I'm in kind of a bind. I don't, uh... Of course. According to history, we disappeared from Wolf 359 at exactly 0800 hours. If we stay here alive, it corrupts the timeline. Our future, but Kalen's past. What are you going to do? Well, the easy thing would be to just obliterate you all, but then that wouldn't be fair now, would it? On the other hand, I do want to protect the timeline. Q snapped his fingers, and we were in blackness for... for... I don't know how long. <coughs> Are we dead? Uh, oh, I don't think so. Uh, then, suddenly, we were back on the bridge, and Q was gone. Where are we, Lieutenant? We are still at Wolf 359, sir. The real question is, when are we? 
according to the navigational charts, correcting for time. We have jumped ahead more than 10 years. It's clever. I don't understand. We disappeared from Wolf 359 exactly when history says we did. Timeline is unaffected. We're still alive. Thanks to you, Cadet. If you hadn't come back to get us, we'd be dust. Captain, what about Quint? We looked around. The real Quint was nowhere to be found. Oops. I almost forgot. There was a flash of white light. And suddenly he was there, looking a little startled. Where am I? What's going on? Wait. I don't think I want to know. Captain, I'm picking up the vessel 34 Mark 216, heading on a course for Earth. It's the Borg. The Borg. In my timeline, my present, they were headed for Earth, just as they were 10 years ago at Wolf 359. What are your orders, sir? We're a Starfleet ship in Federation space. We may be 10 years behind the times, but I bet we know a thing or two more about the Borg than anyone else in this time. Lay in a pursuit course. I looked over at Lieutenant Furlong, Dad. He walked up to me. He looked me over. He smiled again. I, uh, I think I'm going to enjoy getting to know you, Cadet Furlong. I knew I was going to enjoy getting to know him. Course laid in, sir. Engage. The rest is part of the official log. We arrived at Earth along with the other Starfleet vessels, and, with the new weapons, destroyed the Borg forces. While the Righteous was being refitted, her crew has been attending special remedial classes here at the Academy to help them catch up on the advances of the last ten years. Now, both ship and crew are ready for the present. At 1,200 hours today, the Righteous ships out. Without me for now. But Captain Andropov has promised to consider me for a security posting aboard the Righteous as soon as I graduate from the Academy. Come. Dad. Come on, Caitlin. The Righteous leaves in two hours. If you want to get in some fishing before I go, we'd better hurry. Oh, sorry. I'll be right there. I just have to finish this. Remember, Captain Andropov doesn't like to be kept waiting. Personal log. Addendum. If they could, everyone would go back in time to save a loved one from death. I risked changing the course of my own life, of Federation history, just to save my father. Who knows what cascading effect my time travel might have had. There are legal and moral prohibitions against it, as there should be. But I know one thing. If Q gave me the chance, I'd do it again. End log entry. In a flash, I'd do it again. been listening to the Star Trek Borg audio experience. It was adapted for audio by Hilary Bader from the CD-ROM story written by Hilary Bader. Star Trek Borg audio program was derived from the Star Trek Borg CD-ROM. The actors include Jeff Allen, John Cothran Jr., John DeLancey, Julie Donald, Barry Lynch, Howard McGillan, Marnie McPhail and Murray Rubenstein. The original sequences were directed for CD-ROM by James L. Conway and the executive producer was Keith Halper. Music by Dennis McCarthy. For the audio program, Florence Burrow Adams was the associate producer. Editing by Jocelyn Gonzalez. Post-production by Karen Perlman. Star Trek Borg was produced and directed for Simon & Schuster Audio by Karen Frillman.
Star Trek Borg is also available from Simon & Schuster Interactive.